Jersey TV. No one gave more truth to the human race or higher truth to the human race than our apostle, the apostle Paul. He gave us truths, magnificent truths, that will not be found in any other parts of scripture except in Paul's letters. He brought them to us directly from the glorified Christ, the Son of God. And the Son of God got them from his Father. Here's the chain of delivery. God, his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul, to us. These were secrets hidden from the disruption of the world that were revealed to, of all people, us. There are no more secrets. God is now looking at us face to face. Paul was a revealer of secrets, and we see God in the face of Christ, and we see Christ through these secrets, these teachings, yes, teachings that were given to us by the Apostle Paul. And these teachings are so great, and they're so nearly incredible, but God does give us the faith to believe them, that they are constantly under attack. And we know this. They're constantly under attack by people who doubt them, by people for whom these truths are just too high, too magnificent. It takes boldness to believe in the snatching away, for instance. It takes boldness to believe in the salvation of all it takes boldness to believe that there are spiritual powers of wickedness among the celestials. Who tells us more about these than Paul? And that they operate through human beings. The origins of Christ. God's favorable opinion of the whole human race because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. But as I said, this comes with the territory. Every great truth will be opposed. But this is to help us become established. As the apostle said, there must be sects among you that those who are qualified may be becoming apparent among you. And we become more entrenched, more stable, more founded, more rooted, more grounded in the truth because of the opposition. But the one thing we don't want to happen is to ever let the opposition, those opposers, talk us out of what we have in Christ. But they are out there by divine design, and they will try to talk you out of your peace, to talk you out of your justification, to talk you out of the salvation of the world. The armor of God protects the truth. This armor exists it doesn't have to be concentrated into existence. It already exists, just like salvation already exists. And we come to realize salvation. I already spoke on some of them, but here are the great Pauline truths. Salvation by grace, not law. Good behavior via grace, not via willpower or struggle. Personal justification. You never hear that from anyone except through Paul, personal justification and personal freedom. You don't find that under the circumcision evangel. You don't find the freedom. The freedom to make mistakes, the freedom even to abuse the freedom that we have in Paul. You will not find that. So great is the freedom we have that it can be abused with no loss of favor from God. We have a personal assurance through Paul that God is at peace with us. This truth is constantly assailed, and it has been through the ages. Only Paul reveals the accomplishments of the cross, that it conciliated God to the world.
God is now at peace with the world. You will not hear that in any other part of the Bible except 2 Corinthians chapter 5, another great truth from the Apostle Paul. Only in Paul can you prove the salvation of all. Other verses and other places in Scripture hint at it. I'm constantly seeing 100 verses, 500 verses proving the salvation of all. There are not that many verses that prove the salvation of all. There are about six or seven. Seven's a better number. I'll say seven. And they're all found in Paul. You have other, many places in Scripture that hint at it, that suggest it. But only in Paul can you prove it. And this is a salvation that is actual, not potential. Only with Paul do you read of God calling out a body of people to rule among the celestials in the heavens and not on earth. And again, these truths are so great. All accomplished by the death of of Jesus Christ on the cross, his entombment and his resurrection. And he died for our sins. And because of his shed blood, we have this freedom. We have this grace. And again, it's worth saying again that the, uh, the, the freedom is so great that it can be abused. It's real freedom. That proves that it's real freedom. And we don't want anybody to abuse it. But it can be abused without any loss of love or peace or favor from God. You will reap what you sow in the flesh. However, as far as Aeonian life is concerned, nothing is now condemnation. This is appalling truth that is constantly being assailed. It was assailed in Paul's day. It's assailed today. And it is for this that the armor of God is is explained to us in minute detail by Paul. Why Paul? Why don't other writers of the scriptures talk about the armor of God? Because what? Uh, because of what I just told you. Paul reveals the greatest of truths that will invite the greatest of oppositions. That's why. And that's why it appears at the end of Paul's career. He's divulged all these secrets, disgorged these beautiful truths from the throne of God. And now in Ephesians, he's basically telling you that these truths will be assailed. He doesn't use these words. I'm going to read the exact words he does use. This truth will be assailed constantly, and you need to protect not your person. This armor of God is not to protect you from Satan's frontal attacks because Satan's frontal attacks all work for your good. All things are working together for the good of those who love God called according to his purpose. So Satan's frontal attacks, they frustrate the crap out of Satan because they all work for good. He can't do anything to you frontally. I mean, sure, you can get sick. You can have a series of unfortunate events, but ultimately these are all from God and they are for your ultimate good to prepare you for your place in the celestial realm when we're done with this boot camp down here the armor of god's not for any of that the armor of god is to protect the truth what christ did for us and for the world for the whole universe was so evident it was not done in a corner he spoiled he christ despoiled principalities and powers making an open show of them. And Satan was devastated, devastated by the relay of this information. Satan doesn't want you to know that God's a savior of all. Satan doesn't want you to know that God's at peace with you constantly. Satan doesn't want you to realize the justification taught by Paul that you're in good standing with God no matter what you do. Satan doesn't want you to know that we're Sin abounds, grace superabounds. He doesn't want you to know you can't sin your way out of grace. He wants you to continually analyze yourself, to be worried, to be fretting. Satan's problem is these truths are written down so plainly, so clearly by our apostle that you would think it would be impossible to deny these truths. Ah, but ladies and gentlemen, Satan is a clever adversary. And he has designed lies because John 8, 44, he's a liar and the father of it. And he has designed lies 
to talk you out to talk you out of these truths to divert your attention. God has put the hope diamond on display. The hope diamond is on display. The Natural History Museum in Washington D.C. I've seen it. Many of you have probably seen it as well. Let me draw an analogy here. The hope diamond is your justification. And there it is, sitting in a public exhibit for all to see. But Satan doesn't want you to see it. So he stands outside the Natural History Museum, handing out pamphlets for the Air and Space Museum. He wants you to go somewhere else. He wants to divert you. Doesn't want you to look the gem in the face. He's a liar, he's a liar, he's a liar. And this armor protects you from his lies. Verse 10, Ephesians 6. For the rest, brethren, mind be invigorated in the Lord and in the might of his strength. And again, this is his strength. This is God's armor. Put on the panoply of God. That is the full armor. That's a concordant word. It just means every implement. Those, those are the literal elements in the Greek. To every implement of God to enable you to stand up. Here's the purpose of it stated right here by Paul. To enable you to stand up to the stratagems of the adversary. That word stratagem included in that definition is trickery. Strategy. Deceit. And it's a capital A adversary. We're talking about Satan. The prince of darkness. But look what the prince of darkness does. Verse 12, for it is not ours to wrestle with blood and flesh, but with the sovereignties, with the authorities, with the world mights of this darkness, with the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. That was verse 12. And Satan is the head of these principalities and powers. And he sends them to confuse you because confusion is the nature of his game. Satan blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving so that the illumination of the glory of Christ does not illuminate them. And so, when we come up against opposition to these truths, we need to recognize that behind that opposition is dark forces. Any one of us can at any time be used by Satan to deny the truth if we're not founded on it. Look at Peter. Peter tried to talk his Lord out of the cross. The Lord began to prophesy concerning his death, and Peter said, Far be it, Lord, that this should happen to you. We will save you. What did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. There you go. Any one of us can be an agent, an unwitting tool of the adversary, and his minions called by the apostle here, sovereignties, authorities, world mites of this darkness with spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. I think we're used to seeing these movies like The Exorcist where demons manifest themselves as these uh, growling, drooling, scary monstrosities. But that's not how Satan manifests himself. Oh, no, no, no. It's with lies. Slick, seductive Lies served up on a silver platter with a smile and possibly organ music and even persuasive language. Human philosophy. Paul warns against philosophy in Colossians. Human philosophy. Well, it won't hurt to take a philosophy class, will it? My son Luke, my middle son, took a philosophy class his first year in college and he was an atheist within months. Huh, Satan didn't show up with fangs drooling and claws and scaring everybody. No, he just sent these sovereignties and authorities and world mites into the college world to confuse people with human philosophy. Talked my son right out of the truth. Satan did the same thing with my youngest son, Paul, by a different way. My son Luke is a worldly unbeliever. My son Paul is a religious unbeliever. My son Paul was hijacked by these sovereignties and authorities and world mites of darkness. And who did they use? Other human beings. 
not other human beings, because these sovereignties and authorities and world mites are not human beings, but he used flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against, literally, blood and flesh. I mean, those are the ones that we see. Those are the ones that are enacting the satanic plan, the satanic agenda, but we need to look behind them. So my youngest son got hijacked by people telling him lies, telling him, like, your father's, he doesn't have a theological degree. What, what does he know? I mean, he believes that everybody's going to be saved. We know that's not true. Look at the rich man and Lazarus and on and on and on in the sovereignty of God, the lies, the lies they tell, the lies they tell, the scriptures they misuse in order to cast doubt into the mind. And it's effective as hell. That's what this armor is for. This is serious business. And this is how, again, Satan manifests. Whispered lies. Lies in textbooks. Lies from exalted podiums. Lies in the movies. Lies in culture. Lies in music. Lies, lies, lies. The world is full of lies. The only place we find the truth, the only place we find dependable Revelation is in the scriptures and specifically in Paul's letters. This is why Paul's the one telling us about the armor of God. Verse 13, therefore take up the panoply of God that you may be enabled to withstand in the wicked day. We will need this armor of God. I heard somebody say, I think it was Pastor Clay Kent, that we're going to need this armor of God when we're in the celestial realm because we're going to be fighting, 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 and we're going to really be under attack then. No, we're going to be bathed in the light. We're going to be immortal. We don't need the armor of God then. Therefore, take it up to withstand in the wicked day. In Galatians 1, 4, Paul calls this the present wicked end. We need this now because this is when we're susceptible. This is when we're weak. This is where Satan wants to talk us out of it. Satan wants to keep members from coming. And he wants to keep people from becoming members of the body of Christ. This explains his lie of the Trinity and his lie of free will. To keep people from even believing the truth of the body of Christ. The truth that belongs to the body of Christ. Explained by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Satan doesn't even want people to get started, so he lies, he lies, he lies. In the wicked day, the present wicked end, when we're weak. Like I said, when we're weak. He wants to kill the caterpillar in the cocoon. That's what Satan wants to do. Where did he attack Christ? On the cross. Before that, after his 40 days of fasting, when he was weak, 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 in the wicked day. But Paul says we can stand. How do we stand? Verse 14, stand then, girded about your loins with truth. There it is, the loins, the the seat of power in the human body with truth. That's what we're about. That's what I'm all about. The truth as found in the scriptures. It's harder than it sounds because in order to understand truth, we have to know how to read the scriptures. We have to know laws of language. We have to look up words. We have to look into the Hebrew and the Greek. To know what God said, we need to struggle to find. If you want to struggle, here it is. Struggle to find a good translation of Scripture. We don't have to struggle to be righteous before God, but it does take a struggle to find a version of Scripture that accurately gives us the truth of God. And that version for me is the concordant literal New Testament. And it has its own concordance in the back that you can, so you can check up on the translator. The translator says, I want you to check up on me. Don't believe me. Here's a concordance right in the Bible. You ever see that before? I never had. Stand then, girded about your loins with truth, with the cuirass of righteousness put on. A cuirass. Why doesn't it say breastplate? Why can't it just be simple like the King James Version? Because this ain't the word for breastplate. The breastplate only protects your front. Satan attacks you from your back because he's a snake in the grass. He attacks from the back. He's tricky. He has stratagems. He has ploys, tricks. And what is the, qu the queerest of righteousness? That is, whenever anyone attacks the truth of your justification by faith, whenever, you, whenever anyone, and we've had recent examples of it, whenever anyone causes you to doubt your salvation, 
to to point at you and say, yeah, are you sure you're justified? I don't see how you could be justified because I know you. I know who you are. I know what you did. I know the kind of person you are. You need to work at this. You need to examine your life more closely. You need to become like Jesus. You need to struggle. You're too relaxed. You're not taking this sin thing seriously enough. You stand girded about your loins with truth, and for this specifically with the queerest of righteousness put on. That is, I'm righteous, mofo. I am righteous. That's the queerest of righteousness. And all those fiery arrows will ding, ding, ding off of you. I'm righteous. God, why am I righteous? Because I behave myself? Because God's looked at my life like Santa Claus and he figures I'm nice instead of naughty? No, because God declared you to be righteous through your faith, which God gave you, your faith in the blood of Christ, in the faith of Christ, in shedding his blood for the sins of the world. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Keep telling you, I'm righteous. I'm righteous. I'm right. God calls me righteous. God says I'm righteous. Not your personal opinion. God says I'm righteous. God says I'm righteous. That is the queerest of righteousness put on. You put it on. You this put on, I don't have time to go into details of this in the Greek. It's the, the verb is in the middle voice, not the passive, not the active. It's nothing you take like those cartoonish Christian illustrations and put it on yourself. And it's not passive either where you just sit there and do anything. It's a realization. It's a mental assent to a truth. And the truth is that God has declared you to be righteous. Verse 15, and your feet sandaled with the readiness of the evangel of peace. Peace follows justification. You cannot have peace unless you know that God looks at you favorably, that you're good with God. You and God are good. You can't have peace. Peace follows justification. And anyone who wants to take away your peace, they only need to take away your justification or your apprehension of your justification. They can't take away your justification, but they can sure as hell take away your apprehension of it, your understanding of it. By telling you lies, by slipping in. The circumcision slipped into the Galatian Ecclesia with sweet talkers, like a bunch of used car salesmen. Paul told you what? That's what the adversary did with Eve in the garden. God told you what? Oh, no, no, no. This is not the exorcist. Your feet, everywhere you go, everywhere you walk, sandaled with the readiness of the evangel of peace. Not only for your own peace, but to proclaim it, proclaiming peace, which we find in 2 Corinthians 5, that God is conciliated to the world. That is, God has made peace with the world through the blood of Christ. Nobody, hardly anybody except for us, knows that truth. According to the Christian religion, everybody's on probation. Everybody better watch it. God's like Santa Claus. Going to find out if you're naughty or nice. Waiting for you to screw up, and he's going to pull the rug out from under you. He's Simon Cowell. He's waiting to... Send you back home instead of to Hollywood. Oh, yeah, be careful. God, no. Sandal yourself with that evangel. And that evangel is a beautiful thing to be sandaled with because it's true whether people believe it or not. That's the glorious thing about telling that to people. Say, like you don't even have to believe what I'm telling you, but God is now at peace with you. All your worry, all your fretting about yourself, it's on your side of the fence, man. It's on your side of the window pane. On the other side of the window pane, God is shining. His sunlight on you, he's smiling on you. What the, What are you all worried about? Isn't it great to have a kind of message like that? Verse 16, with all, taking up the large shield of faith. Faith, believing God. Some of the things Paul says are so fantastic, people can't believe it. The snatching away is a perfect example. That God is going to change us while we're alive, make us immortal on our feet without having to die. And then we're going to rise to meet the dead in Christ who have been made immortal moments before. We're going to rise and meet them in the air, in the clouds, and then Christ is going to take us to be with him. Sounds like a fairy tale. Sounds like an LSD trip. Or something. Somebody on mushrooms here? No, this is the truth of God, but this requires faith. We do not have the faith to believe in such a fantastic thing. But is that really any more fantastic than justification? 
than having peace with God? Than being called as a member of the body of Christ, whose destiny is a celestial realms, in order to return a disjointed and disunified and rebellious celestial world to God? It's all tough to believe. And as I just said, we can't do it on our own. We have no personal reservoir of faith to meet that challenge, to answer the bell. This is why faith is a gift. Romans 12, 3, God parts to each the measure of faith. Philippians 1, 29, to you it has been graciously granted not only to be believing on him. See, graciously granted to be believing on him, but to be suffering for his sake also. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for in grace through faith are you saved. Actually, in the Greek, have you been saved? It's in the complete verb form. And this is not out of you. What is not out of you? The faith is not out of you. What is it then? It's a gift of God. And once you have that faith, baby, just hold it right in front of Satan. It's called the large shield of faith, by which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the wicked one. Fiery arrows. Why does Satan have fiery arrows? Aren't regular arrows good enough? Don't regular arrows kill a person? Of course they do. Just ask General George Custer. But Satan puts fire on it to scare you. He likes the pyrotechnics. My favorite example, my favorite movie of all time, The Wizard of Oz. The great and powerful Oz. Talk about pyrotechnics. Had some good 3D animation there with that big green scary face and the fire coming up from the sides. <laughs> Scared the crap out of the cowardly lion. Pete himself jumped out the window. It was all front. It was all front. And it took a little dog to go behind the curtain, pull the curtain, and there's a little old man working the controls there. <laughs> pay no attention. I um, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. No. No, we're going to pay all attention to the man behind the curtain. Our enemy, the adversary, is defeated. He can't do anything about any of this except lie about it, except divert you to another location. You don't want to see that. You don't want to go to the Natural History Museum. I'm going to take you over to the National Archives. How about Ford's Theater? You want to see where Lincoln was shot? Oh, it's going to be great. Why don't you climb to the top of the Washington Monument? Get a great view of the ellipse from up there. No. But it's fear. Fear keeps people from so many things. Fear keeps people from living their lives to the fullest. Fear keeps people... From believing in justification because they just are so used to trusting in themselves, they, don't, they can't let go because they're afraid. If I let go, if I let my guard down, then I'm going to screw it up and God's going to hate me. Fear, fear, fear. You're acknowledging the fiery arrows of the wicked one. But no, you grab that shield of faith, put it up there, and listen to those arrows pink, pink, pinking off. And you can just flip the bird to his fire on the arrows. Flip, the, flip it off. I do. Flip it off. What? Fire. Fiery. Oh, look at the fire. <laughs> You're defeated foe, Satan. You're a liar. Oh, Satan doesn't like that. He crawls away. It's Satan. It's Satan that jumps, pees himself and jumps out the window. That's what's supposed to happen. Satan is supposed to piss his pants and jump out the window. Piss his furry little suit and jump out the window. That's what Satan does when we pick up the large shield of faith. Verse 17, I'll end with this. And receive the helmet of salvation. Ooh, the helmet. This has to do with your thinking, with your apprehending. Paul's gospel, so great. This is a gospel of realization and recognition. It's a gospel not of doing, but of knowing. You have to know first before you can do. You, ha you have to have light before you can produce fruit. This is unique to Paul's gospel. 
in the circumcision gospel, they want to see fruit. They want to see fruit. And then God's going to do nice things for you. In our gospel, God does nice things for you first. Then you produce the fruit. But you have to believe the nice things. The helmet of what? The helmet, the thinking. The, the helmet of salvation. We are some of the few human beings on this planet who proclaim the salvation of all. Universal reconciliation. That God is at peace with the world. That's the helmet of salvation. But we need to remember it for ourselves. This is not like the feet sandaled with the readiness of the evangel of peace where it's not only for our own comfort, but it's to take out to other people. But this helmet of salvation, since it's the helmet of salvation, this tells me that this is particularly for us to apprehend and to keep it in our apprehension always. That God's the savior of all humanity. It helps you deal, it helps you deal with some nutcases in the human race. Some weirdos out there, some real jerks, but the helmet of salvation. God's the savior of them too. I was like them. I can, you can still criticize them. You can still not like them. But you certainly have a better opinion of them and you know of their future when you are, when you receive. See, these are all, what have you gotten that you have not obtained? What is What do you have that you have not received? And receive the helmet of salvation. We didn't invent this truth. We didn't drum it up on an LSD trip. We received this truth from Paul, who received it from Christ, who received it from God. And finally, the only offensive weapon here in the whole panoply of God is the sword of the Spirit. What's that? It's a declaration of God. What? God said. And now I come back to a good version of Scripture. I come back to work, to rightly dividing the word of truth, or as the concordance says, correctly cutting the word of truth. Be unashamed workmen. Correctly cutting the word of truth. Work. It's work. To know what the declarations of God are. But ladies and gentlemen, we have them. And we're confident that we have them because of the hard work, I'm thinking of the hard work of Mr. A. E. Nock, who translated the Concordant version, the first version ever to come into existence with a method of translating, with a, an actual system where, the, where there was translating done, not interpreting. Go to concordant.org and you can get a copy of the Concordant Literal New Testament with the freaking Concordance in the back so you can check up on the translator himself. A declaration of God. We have to know what God says, and we have to be careful about it. And it is my fervent prayer always to be careful about it. I don't want to tell you anything wrong. And so I have studied personally to show myself approved. And this is of God. And I guess I'll end with this. I thought I was going to end with that, but I see my time. It's okay. During every prayer and petition, be praying on every occasion. And I want you to pray for everyone in the body of Christ. In spirit, being vigilant also for it with all perseverance and petition concerning all the saints and for me. I'd like you to do that for me. And for me, Paul says, that to me expression may be granted in the opening of my mouth with boldness to make known the secret of the evangel. You pray for me, I'm going to pray for you. That we speak boldly, that we believe boldly, and that we defend the truth boldly.